let me go ahead. Welcome everyone. Welcome, welcome. I'm going to go ahead and turn the waiting room off. Hi, Simone. Um, so we don't have to monitor this, but yeah, again, uh, thank you everyone for being here. Um, this is our um, last edition of a really what's been a really exciting uh, series um, for us this semester. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Janae Adams and uh, I'm the founder of the Black Women in Computational Biology Network um, and in really just a growing community of, of Black women in the comp bio field um, who work together to create a safe space to connect um, and uplift one another um, and, and to really just network. Um, and this Black and Comp Bio series was um, put on as an opportunity for our community to continue engaging with the broader Comp Bio community, um, but something that really would center um, Black, Black scientists in the field. And so we've been really blessed to have so many scientists so far um, join us in presenting and really just um, amazing conversation and, and, and dialogue around some really important and, and fun topics in science and computational biology. Um, and we're really grateful today to have Dr. Paul M uh, Mugwene, I think that's how you say it, right? Yep. <laughs> yes, <laughs> here, um, here with us um, and uh, Melissa Minto, um, a close colleague in the, in the Duke community who, who will um, introduce him. So yes, everyone, thank you so much for being here and, and we'll jump right in. If Melissa, do you want to yeah, hi guys. Uh, nice seeing you all. Um, this has been my first seminar back in a while, so I'm excited. Um, I'm here to introduce Paul. Paul is an associate professor of biology at Duke, and throughout his career, he's worked on large animals like dinosaurs to teeny tiny organisms such as yeast. Um, at Duke, he runs a experimental and computational lab uh, where the research focuses on gene regulation, especially at, um, related to the phenotypic and morphological variation in yeast. Um, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Paul Mabini. Thank you, uh, Janae, and thank you, Melissa. I'm really uh, happy and excited to be talking to this group today. Um, I wanted to do a little bit of a I guess a, a Zoom survey before we started um, to get a sense of, uh, you know, who's uh, who's here in this seminar. Um, it, uh, and let me just say, if, if you feel comfortable doing so, and you um, and you're able to turn on your video um, feed, uh, I'd encourage you to do so. Uh, give me some sense that I'm actually talking to a to a live audience. Um, uh, as opposed to a bunch of bunch of names on the screen, um, I understand that you know, given the circumstances we're all working in these days, that not everybody can do that. Um, but if you feel comfortable doing so, and you can, um, you know, please uh, let me see your your smiling faces. Um, as we get started here, yeah. Let, so I, I was wondering, I want to find out uh, who you are, um, and I thought maybe I just just uh, try and get a sense of where um, people in the room are in terms of their journeys as scientists. Um, so maybe we can um, do this in terms of, uh, you know, clicking the, the, uh, the little thumbs up button um, in, the, uh, in the reactions uh, menu in Zoom. Um, can I get a, get a sense of who is a graduate student uh, in this group? How many graduate students do we have? Keep them up, keep them up. Looks like maybe about two, two thirds, two thirds of folks in the room are, are graduate students. Um, and of those who are graduate students, how many of you are um, say in, the, in the, your first two years or three years, say pre prelims? Okay, good number of you. Um, how many, uh, actually I ask, how many undergraduates do we have in the room? Do we have any undergraduates in attendance? Don't wanna forget the undergrads. I don't see any undergrads. Um, postdocs? Few, few, okay, good number of postdocs. Um, or um, in other, other academic 
post but post graduate school uh, research positions. Well, and and faculty. <laughs> All right. Um, and then, do we have any any folks working in industry or policy or NGOs? Okay. All right. There's a, a good mix here. <clears throat> um, and and I'm curious, how many how many of you would call yourselves computational biologists? How many of you are card carrying computational biologists? Let me know where I, where I can get a card. All right. Um, and how many of you would call it, how many how many would call themselves biologists broadly? Okay. Computer scientists. Also a good number. Um, statisticians. How many of you wear all of those hats? Or many of those hats? Nobody, you know, few people would say I wear all those hats, but okay. Yeah, well, that's, that's, uh, I appreciate, appreciate the, uh, yeah, seeing, seeing that it gives me a sen good sense of, of who I'm talking to. Um, and where you're coming from. Um, uh, when I was invited to give this talk, and I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, share my slides here. Just give me a second to go, to go into my share screen. Uh, I hope you can all see my uh, my PDF viewer here. I'm going to go ahead and make this full screen. Um, so when I when I was invited to give this talk, I was sort of thinking about you know what I was going to talk about, um, and sort of my own own journey to becoming uh, a computational biologist. I don't yeah I I, uh, I I say I'm an accidental computational biologist because um, I certainly didn't set out to be a computational biologist uh, when I in my first semester in, in graduate school many a moon ago, um, um, but uh, over my academic journey. Um, I found myself drawn to problems in computational biology and the approaches um, <clears throat> that computational bi biology, you know, is a very broad field, the, the types of approaches that computational biologists use. Um, and I think I've so, you know, somewhere along the line, I, I, I adopted that as one of the things I, uh, I, I call myself. And of course, that, you know, that, that changes for all of us, depending on who we're talking to and, and the prob particular problems we're working on at any given time. Um, um, uh, as much as I'm a computational biologist, I'm also, uh, I would probably say I'm a biologist first. The, the questions that really motivate me um, are questions about, about sort of uh, biology and uh, phenotypic variation and, um, and biological form and function over time um, and um, within and between populations and species, uh, et cetera. Um, so the, you know, if I, if I had to choose, um, you know, somebody said, no, you, you know, make a hard choice. I would probably say I'm a biologist, um, um, but I'm equally, you know, but I, I often find myself equally excited and, and drawn down uh, the path of thinking as a computational biologist. And what I thought I'd talk a little bit about is how I, how I, I came to, um, uh, came to, uh, be involved in computational biology um, and the, the sort of, you know, think a, bit, a little bit about the the skills that I picked up along the way that helped to do that. Um, and observe, you know, a few observations about um, um, uh, what I think has been, what, what I think is useful in terms of thinking about your own academic journeys. And I hope along the way, um, you know, during our, our my talk that uh, there'll be some Opportunities. To, I want to hear about what your thoughts are um, about a, a number of uh, the topics you're going to bring up. Um, so, as Melissa alluded to, and as I as I mentioned, when I when I started graduate school in the fall of 1993, um, I was not at all interested in computational biology. Uh, I, in fact, thought I was going to do one of or maybe some combination of the two things that are represented on this slide. I was really interested in paleontology, vertebrate paleontology. 
Um, and I was very interested in uh, vertebrate biomechanics and physiology. Um, and um, you know, those were sort of my passions that I'd done research in those areas uh, as an undergraduate. Um, and I went to the University of Chicago because um, it was a great place for doing, um, doing those two things. Um, and in fact, my, my, my first, my first you know, publication, you know, one of you know, buried somewhere in the, the middle of the co-authors you know, co list on this publication is um, it, it, you know, contributed to the discovery of a novel theropod dinosaur um, uh, uh, that we discovered in, in um, uh, Cretaceous uh, uh, sediments in in Morocco. So you know the idea of you know going in the field and discovering uh, discovering um, new dinosaurs and um, and uh, understanding sort of morphological variation um, across deep time. Uh, those were really exciting ideas to me, um, and I think that's still really exciting science um, and. Combining that with a perspective on trying to think about how, um, you know, what are the physical constraints, the physical forces that shape animal form and function, um, uh, and how maybe we can apply those principles to extinct animals um, were the things that really got me excited about going to going to grad school. That, so that's 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 you know sort of how how it started. How it's going is, again, as was alluded to, is is quite different. Um, these days, my lab thinks about what I would characterize as, you know, genotypes, networks, and phenotypes. We think about how genetic variation affects gene regulatory and signal transduction networks, and how, in turn, Variation um, in such networks and, and differences in such networks lead to differences in phenotypic outcomes. Um, in particular, and I'll talk a little bit about this at the end, we're um, using this perspective to study the genetic architecture of fungal pathogenesis. What's shown here on the top right is a, as a fungal pathogen, uh, a fungus called Cryptococcus, um, which um, is widespread throughout the environment. Um, um, but if you're unlucky enough to get infected by this, um, uh, uh, by this fungus, um, it can enter, it usually enters through the lungs, gets into the bloodstream, and then goes to the meninges, um, and um, typically has very high uh, uh, mortality rates. Um, um, most people who get Cryptococcus infections uh, are immune compromised. So people with HIV AIDS uh, or who are undergoing various immunosuppressive therapies. Um, and um, uh, it probably it kills upwards of 200,000 people a year um, globally. Um, to, to study questions like this, we use a wide variety of tools. As, as Melissa said, uh, I run a, a, a lab that does both experimental and computational work. I like to say we're a moist lab. Um, and uh, we try and use um, you know, uh, whatever tools we can, um, but it often involves genomics, functional genomics, uh, mathematical modeling, um, quantitative and um, uh, quantitative and population genetic theory, et cetera, um, to try and understand this link between genotype, network, and phenotype. So those are, those are quite different, right? Dinosaurs, dinosaurs to yeast, um, but the in, in between um, has been an equally uh, uh, distinct journey, um, a fun one. Um, uh, involving many different systems, um, and what I thought I'd, and, and many different sort of computational problems along the way. What I thought I'd, I'd talk about a little bit about um, uh, is that journey. And as I talk about it, you know, I don't, you know, I don't want to just do sort of my greatest hits. I, I sort of want to think about a couple of themes that I think are important, especially when when you're thinking, you know, when you're starting your your own scientific journeys, when you're, you know, first couple of years of, of graduate school. I think it's 
think sometimes as faculty, um, you know, we don't talk about um, some of these aspects enough. Um, uh, one is it, it's that scientific careers and research trajectories are highly nonlinear, right? Um, you know, there's a there's a tendency in terms of how we you know how we tell scientific stories um, about how our project developed and and um, the ideas we got along the way to to, to construct these linear narratives, um, and that's not true of any. I've, I've I've you know that's certainly not true of any project I've ever been involved in. You know the the linear narrative we we present in a paper doesn't look like what how they you know the, the project actually came to be and and the results actually emerged. Um, and that's certainly not true of, of scientific careers of anybody I know. Um, I also think it's sometimes useful to think, think I mean, I'd like to hear maybe uh, some of this audience's thoughts about, um, you know, how do you know when to change your research directions or seek out new research directions or pivot? Um, there'll be times in your scientific careers when, um, either op new opportunities present themselves or you realize that a project is not going to produce the results that you're interested in or be as impactful as you're, you'd hope. Um, and sometimes you have to you have to make a, a hard choice to pull a plug on a project. Um, you know, uh, that's, that's very common. Um, but again, something I don't think we talk about um, often in terms of, you know, as we think about um, uh, sort of conveying what, what, what scientific journeys are uh, to students and, and, and scientists early in their careers. I also want to talk a little bit about or highlight what I, th I think is important in terms of um, uh, the importance of serendipity in research and not, and, and I, I and in bringing up serendipity, I don't mean luck, but, but the the sort of serendipitous discoveries and opportunities and interactions um, that we have over our careers that can change that can lead to new insights that uh, can sometimes change what you're working on um, or create you know new collaborations um, and I want to emphasize that I think you know this there's ways that we can structure how we approach problems or how how we approach our science that in terms of creating such opportunities for serendipity. Um, certainly, and certainly uh, mentors and collaborators um, and those around you are, are a, a key aspect of, of creating that environment where serendipitous things can, you know, interaction, scientific interactions can happen. Um, and then, you know, finally, I'll, I'll sort of mention it's something, an observation that I've I've made along the way in terms of different models for mentoring. Different scientific fields have uh, very different um, traditions in terms of how students are mentored, um, and I'm not sure there's any anyone that is particularly right or wrong. But I think they have you know interestingly different consequences or different um, they lead to sort of interestingly different ways to uh, approach. Uh, when science and, and, and training and, you know, they have knock on effects, right? We tend to mentor in the way that we, we ourselves were mentored. Um, and uh, I think it's sometimes useful to sort of think about, you know, think critically about that um, and, um, and, uh, and assess whether or not, you know, you know what, what works and what doesn't. And I, again, I'd be very, very interested to hear this group's feedback in terms of what types of mentoring um, you find effective, um, and oftentimes that's very different for, for, for different individuals. Um, so along the lines of, of, of talking about the fact that, that careers are nonlinear, I'll mention that I actually had a dissertation project that didn't, that I, that didn't turn into a dissertation project. Um, so as I said, when I came into came to started graduate school in 1993, I was interested interested in paleontology and biomechanics. Um, somewhere along the line, uh, I had realized that um, that I was very interested in, in populations and and um, and really found myself wanting to work with with extant animals. Um, 
and um, uh, as excited as I was about paleontology, I decided to leave that uh, uh, aside as in, in terms of my main main emphases. Um, and I started working on these weird weird animals uh, shown here. These are actually they look sort of wormy or snaky. Um, these are actually limbless lizards um, um, of a group called Amphisbenia. And um, I also worked on, on, uh, on a completely independent uh, lineage of limbless lizards called skinks. Um, uh, this was this a project that involves trying to study the ecology of these, these weird animals. Um, uh, they're really sort of fascinating in terms of how they make their living. Um, most of them are burrowers living in, in sediments. Um, there's really interesting questions about um, the biomechanics of burrowing um, and how they dig through soils of different types. Um, and um, and um, limblessness is, is in fact a, a, a trait that's evolved multiple times uh, in lizards. Um, and so I was interested in questions about sort of convergent evolution. Um, I I went quite quite a bit down the you know uh, made quite a bit of progress on this project before I ultimately decided it wasn't um, what I was going to do in in terms of my dissertation. I spent several field seasons in Puerto Rico collecting collecting these animals. Um, you know, uh, uh, got 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 small grants to to fund my field work, had these things back in the lab where I built these giant ant farms. Uh, so I could sort of essentially watch how they how they moved and how they burrowed. Uh, I set up collaborations at the Harvard MCZ labs where I could do x-ray movies of these guys burrowing through soils. Um, it, was a, it was a really fun, exciting project. Um, 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 but ultimately one that as a, as a graduate student, I realized um, setting up a, you know, the challenges of setting up a, uh, uh, a new field program um, working with animals you could only get uh, by by taking you know by um, you know traveling across a, you know, uh, you know you know taking an, uh, an airplane ride to collect um, all of those um, all of those challenges you know in you know basically became apparent to me that they were going to um, not be insurmountable but would be significant challenges in terms of actually um, turning my work on uh, on this group of interesting animals uh, into a into a dissertation that I was going to be uh, satisfied with. Um, so uh, my you know sort of ultimately my sort of shift in direction from thinking about paleontology and the, these these limbless lizards to thinking about um, populations and multivariate statistics uh, really came from the fact that I was sort of embedded in this environment where. Um, where I was exposed to all these new ideas, new new approaches that I hadn't had a chance to explore um, as an undergraduate, right? Many of us come into a, a graduate programs thinking we're gonna do X and end up doing Y. Um, and the reason we do that is, right, we learn new things, um, where we have new interactions um, and, um, and you know, hence why, for example, most graduate programs have things like rotations, et cetera. Um, so I think among the, the things that were most important for me in terms of my where my dissertation actually ended up going was I actually took my first stats course. Um, uh, I had somehow avoided taking taking stats as an undergraduate, um, um, and I took this this intro grad stats course taught by uh, a statistician named Stephen Stigler um, at the University of Chicago, and I was like, wow, this is this is a I actually enjoy this. Um, and B, you know, this is actually useful. <laughs> um, you know, every, everybody else, of course, knew that. Um, but uh, being a an, an, an naive and um, and uh, and uh, smart-ass graduate student, I was like, uh, you know, I, I didn't think I actually had to take stats. Um, but lo and behold, yes, I did. Um, besides taking that course, there were there were sort of this environment at the University of Chicago where I was um, that was very much, you know, um, the very much uh, embedded sort of a quantitative, a multivariate approach to thinking about biology. Um, Chicago had a very strong and continues to have a very strong um, group of faculty and students who had uh, in the, what I would call quantitative paleobiology, um, in particular people studying um, uh, invertebrate paleontology, 
um, uh, and um, studying morphological diversity over time um, in invertebrate organisms. Um, there's a very long and illustrious history um, of, uh, of work in that area and going to the semin seminars and courses and interacting with that group um, was a major determin determinant in terms of me thinking about um, multivariate evolution um, and thinking about how multivariate statistics, et cetera, could be integrated into my work. Um, and similarly along those lines, um, uh, morphometrics, the study, the study of biological shape um, became something I was really interested in, um, uh, along with you know, some uh, mixture of thinking about evolutionary genetics, molecular evolution, and systematics. Right? So the, the environments we find ourselves in really do shape, um, uh, shape the, the ideas we're exposed to. Um, and I think one of the, the strong aspects of, of, of the program and the environment I found myself in was, was um, it really encouraged me to sample broadly uh, in terms of what I was reading, who I was talking to, um, and um, the types of ideas I was sort of confronting and struggling with to understand. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's, that's so critical in terms of um, our development as scientists is really that, that sort of very broad view of our fields, but also what other, other related or allied fields are doing. Um, so that, the, those, you know, that, admin, that environment that, um, that, I, that milieu I found myself in, found myself in um, really led to sort of, sort of three main areas in terms of my, my dissertation work. Um, one, developing new statistical methods for thinking about uh, biological shape variation. Um, um, uh, I ended up applying this work uh, to um, study variation in turtle shells uh, because it was uh, an obvious and interesting uh, morphology. Um, and I was using uh, techniques called landmark morphometrics uh, where you um, essentially digitize uh, a phenotype or a mor morphologies of interest using landmark points on um, on the on the morphologies that you're studying. Um, you can see these 12 points uh, shown here on what's called the um, um, uh, this is called the plastron of the turtle shell. So this is the lower part of the turtle shell, um, and trying to understand um, and, and 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 essentially. You know, one major aspect of my thesis was trying to build tools um, and apply um, a set of existing tools to try and understand um, population patterns of variation in shape, how shape um, to characterize shape differences between species, um, and also to use these landmark morphometric tools to try and understand processes of growth. How do you how do you build um, how do you build morphologies? How are morphologies uh, emerge over time? Um, and how do you characterize that statistically? Uh, the other, the other uh, another sort of major aspect of, of what ended up being in terms of my, uh, being in my um, uh, graduate thesis was um, similarly concerned with questions about uh, morphological variation and covariation, um, which is really what shape is about, right? Thinking about shape is about morphological variation and covariation. Um, um, and I ended up uh, using um, and adopting a large number of methods um, from what from the literature that we would call now Gaussian graphical models. I mean, we're not we were calling it that then as well. Um, and, and I think I think this may be the first application of Gaussian graphical models in the evolutionary biology literature. Um, um, and um, and uh, uh, those of you who are familiar with with uh, with graphical models know that essentially these are tools for trying to understand um, uh, the covariance or correlation structure um, in multi uh, in multivariate data uh, in terms of representing them in terms of conditional independent statements. Um, so this graph here on the left. Um, uh, shows, you know, sort of a hypothetical example uh, 
and, um, and it, it implies a set of conditional independent statements about and um, and it sort of uh, implies a certain structure about the underlying covariance uh, matrices that would represent these variables. In my in my in my goal in this in this work was really sort of thinking about applying this to an idea um, um, that had existed for you know more than uh, more than fifty years in the biological literature about ideas about integration and modularity, thinking about how um, uh, how phenotypic traits um, of organisms co-vary together, um, some co-vary tightly together both over development and or evolution um, and just form clusters of, of traits that are um, uh, uh, that seem to, to co-vary together. Um, and then there are uh, weaker interactions between clusters. And this example on the right is, is sort of illustrating this idea um, here applied to looking at va variation, patterns of variation among traits in plants um, that it can be roughly broken down into vegetative and reproductive traits. Um, and the conditional independent structure uh, of this that emerges when you analyze this data suggests that um, uh, indeed that there are um, uh, many more interactions, strong interactions um, between, between traits that are uh, within these groups and weaker interactions between uh, vegetative and reproductive traits. And then thinking about how, how, this, how these patterns of integration and modularity um, would affect evolutionary process. Um, so it turns out that these independence relationships can um, you know, uh, have a very natural expression in terms of our mathematical models for multivariate selection, for example. How do we predict how a population is going to respond to selection over time. Um, um, the, the sort of underlying mathematics of these, of these uh, graph, graphical Gaussian models um, uh, uh, have, has an important role uh, in, those, in those models of multivariate selection. Um, uh, and here I want to sort of highlight, you know, this the, the, the fact that I ended up working on and, and Gaussian graphical models was almost a completely serendipitous discovery because I had I found myself, you know, browsing the the, the shelves of the stats library at the University of Chicago, um, looking for a book on something else. Uh, I think probably path analysis or structural equation modeling, sort of a group of methods that are, um, you know, are, are not totally unrelated to to, uh, to graphical models, um, and I ran across this book by uh, by Whitaker. Um, which when I picked it up off the shelf and started reading it, it was sort of this eye-opening, oh wow, this is this is the sort of approach I'd been looking for. Um, or uh, I didn't know I was looking for it, but this is the sort of approach um, that I could I could use and exploit to, to ask the questions I was interested in. Um, and and I'd say, you know, it's it's amazing when I sort of think back in terms of how my sort of career has developed, where um, reading, you know, a, you know, coming across a, a paper or a book um, or being pointed to something that, you know, some piece of the literature or some corner of the literature that I I would never have have thought to look at myself, right? Um, you know, I, if, in terms of being goal-directed, it would have never, it probably would have never come onto my radar. Um, but um, spending time in the stacks, um, you know, certainly at, at the time, you know, we didn't have PDFs coming, you know, early 90s, PDFs weren't coming across across uh, my, my transom in my email. Um, what we did every week as graduate students was go to the, uh, go to the library, read all the, you know, thumb through all the latest um, journals on the, on the new journal, sh journal shelf at the library. <clears throat> um, and, and also remember very, you know, some very productive, you know, uh, days at a time spent you know, reading, you know, looking through the literature um, uh, in this in the stacks in the various libraries at the University of Chicago campus, um, looking for uh, looking for insight, and um, and I think it's an interesting question: how do we how do we do that in the uh, in the digital age? Um, you know, we all you know we're all aware uh, you can sort of sign up on you know you can set up search terms on PubMed, um, uh, you know. Um, Maybe maybe many of you look for uh, you know you, you 
use bioarchive, keep keep track of you have keywords set up on bioarchive or read people's Twitter feeds. Um, um, but I'm sort of curious, you know, it, it, that that's often requires that you have keywords set up, right? That you're you find what you're looking for. Um, and, and maybe I'll, th I'll take a, a pause here and see if anybody has any has any uh, suggestions or any um, anything that they'd like to share in terms of how do you find how do you in terms of the literature how do you find yourself trying to make such serendipitous discoveries? Do you have ways that you've thought about this this problem of of learning new knowledge outside of the thing outside of what you think you need to know? Don't, don't be shy. Um, hi, my name is Van. I um, try to keep really differently minded friends who study completely different things. I used to do anthropology in my undergrad. So I try and keep like that type of like diversity in different disciplines. Yeah, I think that I think that's 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 a really important way. Um, I think one of the you know, one of the things I was going to emphasize at the end right, is at least for me, part of my part of what made graduate school, you know, ninety percent of graduate school was was the was my was my fellow students, and I'd say only you know maybe maybe I'm selling the faculty short. Yeah, ten percent was the faculty, right? But um, you know is that uh, that that you know community of, of of peers and fellow scientists who are who are pointing out the connections of your work to to other fields or um, things that you don't know about. Yeah, other. Other ways that people want to share in terms of how they how they prime themselves for those sort of serendipitous connections. I'm not monitoring the the chat here, so I don't know if anybody's. Yeah, um, yes, some... oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say that. Um, someone in the chat said daily by archive notifications for new papers across fields are a fun way of seeing new things. Mm -hmm. And so I'm cur curious as the person who, who wrote that, do you, do you, um, are you trying, trying to just see, see whatever is coming across the, the transom in bioarchive or do you, do you do it with keywords or how do you, um, Part of it, right? Always the challenge is is the flood, right? <laughs> there's, there's, how do we deal with the flood but still, still get that breadth? Yeah, uh, I wrote that in the chat, but I, I do subscribe to like certain bioarchive feeds, like for biology and like plant science, and a lot of the papers that come aren't things that I study, but they're still like, oh, what's new in genomics? And filtered a little, at least it's not crazy. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I, I think um, you know there there are some definitely you know tools that I think many of us have, have ad adopted. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sort of curious. Do a lot of people use? How many people actually like use things like Twitter um, as as like is that a is, do you find a lot of serendipitous discoveries through Twitter? Yeah. So, um, oh, and somebody's here because of Twitter. Good. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I mean, I think there, there's a mix of tools and ap approaches, and, I'm, and I think it's it really is is going to continue to you know it's a continuing challenge for our our science, and I think it for our, our growth as scientists is is how do we do that? Um, and I think the other thing I guess I'd reflect on is is um, and this is less true over time because more and more of the the Older literature um, is is becoming digitized, but there's huge wealth of a really important, really fundamental literature that's not that's not available through your um, you know at, at, at in digital form through your library, um, uh, you know, or you can't just download it from the journal. Um, and I'd really encourage you know when especially I guess when we're back when we're able to go to libraries again. Uh, I'd really encourage uh, those of you who are particularly early in your careers to to spend some time in the stacks, um, reading you know reading about the history of your field, um, uh, seeing where uh, how the field has evolved, um, and also looking for you know creating those opportunities for for serendipitous discovery. 
I am I am moving way too slow. Okay, so I'm going to pick pick up the pace a little bit. Um, I did end up doing some biomechanics. I hadn't I didn't <laughs> I didn't totally throw away the uh, 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 didn't totally totally um, uh, lose my first loves. Um, um, uh, but again, the sort of you know biomechanics I did ended up being very informed by um, uh, by the new tools and the new ways of, of thinking um, that I had adopted along along the way. Um, you know, and of course, of course, our graduate uh, school experiences are really shaped by a the our fellow students, and of course, um, we hope, and and in certainly my case, you know, we hope by by um, by thoughtful and supportive mentors. Uh, I really want to call out you know, my two mentors from graduate school, uh, Mike LaBarbera uh, on the left here, and Barry Chernoff were really sort of my co main co advisors. Um, uh, both gave me a huge amount of uh, freedom to think about problems and encouraged me to, to, to think broadly um, across fields. Um, they really, you know, some of the things I'm saying in terms of investing time to learn about the history of your discipline and spending time in the stacks and, um, um, and taking risks and allowing yourself to undertake projects that won't work out, that might not work out. Um, these were all things that, that Barry and Mike gave me the room to do. Um, and, uh, and I think it reflects, you know, really well, you know, reflects their mentoring approach. Um, and, and I think um, a little bit of the sort of mentoring approach that at least my perception is was sort of the norm um, in the in evolutionary biology at the time. And I think maybe still a little bit to the, the same extent um, that, that uh, a very sort of hands off, okay, go and find, you know, um, uh, find your way, um, and sometimes that you know that that I, 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 that worked for me, um, but it, it sometimes that doesn't work, right? And everybody has, you know, everybody has both their own own mentoring styles and different needs in terms of sort of mentoring and feedback and advice. Um, what I always, you know, in terms of trying to find that that happy medium of of independence and and um, working closely with somebody, I always say, I always tell students, you know, I really want you to be fiercely independent, but you know, but I want you to talk to your advisors and mentors frequently and often. Um, uh, you can, you know, I want you to run, you know, run with your ideas and 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 um, try new things. Um, um, but when you circle back frequently, um, uh, you get that opportunity for feedback. Um, uh, a reality check sometimes, um, but also also somebody to share the excitement um, with as you make make progress. Um, I think you know uh, seeking out your own funding as a graduate student that's certainly helpful in terms of you know giving you some independence, right? When when if you can um, if you can cover um, some amount of your own you know own funding um, or or uh, uh, manage to 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 fund projects you're interested in. That's another um, uh, important aspect of uh, gaining independence and giving you that the ability to work outside of what your advisor um, may be funded for at that given moment. Um, and you know, and that means you know, uh, lots you know, writing grants early and often. Um, and you know, learning. You know, we we understand that that's sort of a process, one of the important aspects of academic research. Um, you know, it'd be great if if there were an endless streams of money. There aren't, um, and so um, engaging with that early, um, um, I think, is both important, but also it, it also could be really fun. And it, I, I I always like. I, um, I don't always like, but <laughs> I often like writing grants because it encourages me to think about new ideas or think about problems in new ways. Um, and I often find myself having written a grant very excited about um, about um, the, the prospects of of undertaking you know, what I've just you know what I've just tried to to get somebody else excited about. Um, and I think part of that, um, you know, learning to do that early. And often, as a graduate student, I think was was important. I'll also say, you know, in terms of thinking about serendipitous events, there were lots of other things happening in the, in the mid and late '90s that um, uh, that sort of set the stage in terms of me thinking about being a, a computational biologist. Um, 
Um, certainly the rise of open source computing, you know, these are events that I had no control, uh, control over or, um, or input in, um, but, um, but uh, you know, uh, Unix or Unix-like systems like you know, Linux and B the, the various BSD distributions um, were becoming widely available in the mid 1990s. Um, you know, these are so ubiquitous today that many of you who are, you know, if you're a beginning graduate student, the, the thought of not having access to, to uh, a um, uh, commodity com computing with, you know, running a, a Unix environment, you know, that seems unimaginable. Um, but it was really, you know, quite uh, revolutionary um, in terms of um, computing in the, in the, in the mid 90s. And I think the other thing that really impacted me, my growth in terms of my, uh, thinking about um, um, in terms of my uh, growth as a, as a, in terms of computer science um, and, and, and certainly programming in, in, in a practical aspect was the rise of interactive computing environments uh, suitable for dealing with numerical and statistical computing. Um, um, I started programming in Python and, um, you know, after having spent, you know, too many, uh, several years working in, in C++, but having, when I adopted Python in like 1996, um, you know, it had a huge impact on my research productivity, that interactive loop of, of, of and that very short um, uh, uh, time from idea to, to code um, uh, was really important in terms of my research progress. Um, um, and certainly along the way, um, being introduced to languages like S, which um, most of you are probably familiar with through R these days, uh, I remember picking up this the so-called blue book, the new S language in Powell's bookstore in Hyde Park in like 1995 and being like, oh, I, this is this is this is an awesome environment. This is an awesome tool for thinking thinking statistically. And remember being how excited I was a few years later when uh, the R environment in the in the mid to late 90s started to become um, an actual practical environment free alternative to the quite expensive uh, S environment. Um, that, that was only being sold commercially at the time. Um, so, so moving sort of think from my from my graduate exp uh, school experience to uh, moving into my postdoc. Um, so I would I would say at the end of graduate school I would not even though I was doing a lot of multivariate st statistics and a fair amount of you know pretty serious computing I wouldn't have called myself a computational biologist. Um, but there were, uh, an, again, a number of fields, go, events going on in the field that really set, that set the stage for my, um, for my next chapter as a postdoc, um, and which um, certainly were, um, you know, again, changed not only, you know, obviously my, my directions, um, uh, uh, but have obviously had a huge impact um, on all of our, you know, on the fields generally. Um, the first was the, you know, the first event was, was obviously the first complete eukaryotic genome sequence then published in 1996. Um, I assume you know everybody you know knows that was the budding yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, functional genomics was emerging as a field in the late 90s. You know, arguably the sort of first large-scale genome scale um, um, applications of of um, uh, uh, gene expression microarrays were published like 97, 98. Um, and the uh, in and in terms of computing, high-performance computing became was becoming cheap and ubiqu ubiquitous. Um, you know, it was all the rage in, in like the late 90s to, to build, you know, to start building Beowulf clusters in your, in your lab. Uh, in fact, I, I remember, remember when, I, when I joined Jin Young's lab uh, in like 2001, I was impressed by the, by the, the, the in-house cluster they had, they had bought, uh, built. Um, and so I, I uh, moved, moved to, to Yale, um, where actually I'll skip slides here, uh, where initially I was working with a really talented mathematical population geneticist named Sean Rice. Um, um, unfortunately for me, Sean, <laughs> like the year I started, went on sabbatical <laughs> in, in the mountains of California. So I was, I was sitting there around in New Haven, getting some work done, um, but talking to people. And I was lucky enough to uh, start interacting with this fellow here, who's in the audience, uh, Jun Young Kim. Um, Jun Young was at Yale at the time. Um, and um, uh, uh, as well as Steve Stearns shown here on the right. Um, and uh, it was really sort of through my interactions with the Jun, Jun Young 
and then I, eventually joining his lab uh, that I sort of be, felt like I became a full-fledged computational biologist. Um, and, um, and we worked on a, a variety of problems, mostly trying to exploit um, uh, large-scale functional genomic data that was uh, emerging at the time. Um, so sort of continuing along the lines of some of the things I've been doing in terms of thinking about Gaussian graphical models, we sort of applied some of those ideas to thinking about estimating what we'd call, called genomic co-expression networks um, on a genome-wide scale, um, uh, applying that to, to transcriptomic data, um, as well as um, interesting problems that sort of sort of really drew on it, sort of intersection of thinking about um, the geometry of multivariate spaces um, uh, related to um, trying to, to reconstruct temporal orderings uh, of biological processes through, um, uh, through analyzing uh, large multivariate um, gene expression data sets. Um, and this has sort of become to be known as the pseudo time reconstruction algorithms. And I think this is among the, among the earliest in the field. Um, and again, I think the, the things that were sort of most important in terms of my career, career development were, were again, it's a, a high degree of, of, um, of uh, intellectual freedom and, and really being granted, you know, the space and time to think about problems. Um, that was, those, those were the sort of key aspects of, of working with Jun Young and, and Sean that I really valued. Um, as a postdoc, was was that time to to think and to integrate broadly across across disciplines, um, and um, I think that for me that was the you know those were those were sort of key again key to my to my development. I'll make a, a plug here. For those of you who are interested in mathematical evolutionary theory, I think Sean Rice's evolutionary th theory book, evolutionary theory, I think one of the most insightful uh, 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 introductions to thinking about uh, the mathematics of evolution um, and highly recommended. Um, so as I as I sort of started to transition out of my my postdoc years, and I realize I'm running pretty late here, so I'm gonna gonna keep this really short. Um, I made I took another risk, um, and and I think this is what sort of set me up. What you know why I work on on yeast yeast and fungi today. Um, I was you know I was a, I think I was a pretty much a card carrying computational biologist. I had um, and, I, and I had a, a fair amount of experience working with real biological systems, um, uh, but I wasn't by no means a molecular geneticist, and, and certainly I was not a microbiologist. Yet somehow I got into my head that I, I need when I set up my own lab, I needed to actually <laughs> set up a, an experimental microbiology lab. Um, and um, uh, I, I think Jun Young is actually the, the person who put this in my head <laughs> when he moved from Yale to Penn. He wanted to set up a, a molecular biology lab or reset up a molecular biology lab, um, and then since I was tagging along with him, I said, "Oh, I, that sounds fun. Let's 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 do that together." Um, um, and when I moved on to my um, uh, to uh, setting up my own lab just a couple of years later, um, uh, I somehow convinced the you know the, uh, the Duke that that they should give me money to do the same, um, uh, but I needed to very quickly learn a lot of yeast molecular biology if I was going to do that. Um, and uh, I took uh, uh, this course at, at Cold Spring Harbor Labs um, in summer of 2004. It's really sort of you know three, three, essentially three weeks of the most intensive uh, molecular genetics, you know, uh, 12 hours a day, um, uh, you know, sitting in, in, this, in this lab, looking out in the beautiful, um, beautiful Long Island Sound. Um, but it was was incredibly important in terms of me being able to sort of uh, strike out in new directions, and, and I'm happy to say, you know, 15 years later, last you know, last summer, um, I guess two summers ago now, uh, I returned as an instructor in that course, which was a lot of fun, or uh, a guest 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 instructor in the course. Um, and and that's led, of course, to you know, sort of picking up those new skills. This well, not easy, um, uh, and not not instantaneous has led to lots of new directions, um, but many, but echoing many of the, the questions I had started asking as a, as a graduate student in terms of thinking about evolution and variation of morphological form. Um, now with, a, with a, a, a very much a systems biology and genetics perspective in mind. Um, um, and um, certainly along the way, there have been other 
you know, fortuitous events, again, many of which I don't have control of, um, but have certainly have, um, uh, have certainly um, helped to drive my research in new directions. Certainly, the, the huge you know, orders of magnitude decreases in, in genome sequencing uh, around 2008. You know, we hopped on board um, uh, 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 the, the sequencing train, um, and that again sort of created new opportunities um, uh, for us to, to to ask interesting questions in new and novel ways. Um, that really sort of drew on uh, our past, my past experience in terms of thinking about um, both biological problems, you know, using computation and st statistics. Um, so I'm going to sort of, you know, we've worked on a variety of problems over over the years, um, and I'll just end um, by just giving a, you know, sort of a quick overview of what some of the problems we're currently working on, um, which relate. To fungal pathogenesis, as I alluded to at the beginning of the talk. Um, again, this move into fungal pathogenesis was, uh, was less of a jump than move, you know, starting uh, a yeast lab, um, but, um, but also I took the opportunity to get some new training uh, along the way. Um, and the thing we're really excited about right now in terms of our computational work is thinking about um, what we call, what we, what have been called function valued trait analysis, where we can think about Biological traits like growth as time varying, um, essentially time varying functions. Um, here, showing I'm showing a bunch of growth curves for various uh, for for various segregants of a genetic cross, um, 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 where each where each segregant was measured under a different combination of two different environmental gradients. So we got a gradient of temperature and a gradient of an antifungal drug. Um, and this is showing how they grow under you know, those different combinations of, say, drug and temperature stress. Um, and what we're trying to do is think about function-valued, time-varying QTL, quantitative trait loci. So we're trying to understand the genetic architecture of these complex traits um, by trying to understand how that genetic architecture changes over environments and over time. Here's, um, here's uh, the sort of signatures of QTL signals over time in a single environment. Um, and here you can th then extend this to multiple environments. And there's really interesting problems here in terms of um, thinking about function value traits, the, the st statistical analysis of such traits, um, and, um, and how to exploit such, uh, such data. Um, and that's really led us to new ways to think about um, things like complex epistasis, uh, within and between signaling pathways. That's another big area um, where we're trying to push ahead on both experimentally and computationally. Um, and, um, and you know, again, is forcing us to, to think about new ways, new methods, and to draw on, on the rich set of methods that, um, and, and ideas that are out there across the literature, right? Um, every time you work on a new, if I find myself working on a new project, really, um, uh, it's really an opportunity to go and learn new things, um, and um, and keep. I want to encourage those of you who are getting started with your scientific journeys to keep keep remembering that um, uh, there's lots. There've been lots of brilliant approaches, and they're not all uh, in the computational biology literature that you might be looking at. Uh, just want to obviously uh, acknowledge lots of you know, lots of the people who've contributed to. Uh, did these my scientific journeys along the way? Uh, here's a bunch of the, the graduate students and postdocs um, um, uh, who've played some key roles uh, or continue to play key roles. Um, I won't go through names uh, other than I'll mention uh, Dave McCandless. McCandlish was my first grad student. Um, actually, did a postdoc at, at Penn. Penn there and now has his own lab at Cold Spring Harbor. Um, uh, and um, and many collaborators who've um, who helped to create these sort of serendipitous interactions and discoveries along the way as well. Um, let me end here, and and hopefully we'll have maybe time for uh, a comp a question or two. Um, but I don't don't want to keep anybody um, by going too late. Thank you. So um, if there are any questions, uh, go ahead and put them in the chat or feel free to 
just uh, unmute. Okay, I, I see people have had some additional, okay, that's really nice to see some of the additional things that people put in the chat about um, different ways that they, uh, you know, try and create, you know, create opportunities to, to, to read across fields or the types of courses that they're, um, you know, exploiting online courses. Um, that's, that's an awesome uh, lecture where everyone just talks about their sabbaticals. That would be a lot of fun. Um, uh, if you have an opportunity to take a sabbatical um, uh, or, you know, to, um, you know, to take, to, you know, to take an extended course, um, I, you know, in, in your postdoc years or your, um, certainly as a faculty member, that's, um, that, that can be hugely influential in your, in, tra in your trajectories. How do you balance the time? So here, I'll, I'll, I see some questions popping in the chat, so I'll read them here. So one question is from, um, how do you balance the time constraints between producing results on your main project and reading widely, being curious, but don't have an immediate payoff? Um, yeah, so that that that's a challenge. And I, and I find, you know, I, I think certainly as I advanced through my career and started running a lab, that's become even more of a challenge. Um, and I will say I don't I don't find myself having the, the time to read as broadly as I as I used to, which I, I really miss. Um, so I, I think one of the strategies I've tried to adopt in recent years is really to, in fact, you know, block off time uh, on my calendar. Like this is this is you know, in the same way I would schedule an appointment with a student, blocking off, you know. Uh, uh, an hour or an hour and a half a week um, to do that, to, to try and do that that broad thinking or that broad exploration is something I've, I've tried to do, not always successfully. Um, you know, time management for all of us is, or for many of us, myself, myself included, is, is a challenge. Um, and I find that, um, that unless I intentionally make that space, uh, it tends to get sucked up by other things. Um, so that's been my my strategy. Um, I'm curious if people have other strategies for doing so. Uh, you know, as a grad student, I used to just go lot, get myself lost in the stacks, um, and I didn't have a cell phone, so there, there were no, there were no uh, uh, there were few distractions when I did that. Um, I, I don't have that luxury today. How do you feel about having started in evolutionary biology? I feel that was critical for me because such a wide variety of techniques and conceptualizations of the field. That's a question from Jun Young. Yeah, so I, I, um, uh, I, I as I said at the beginning, I'm, I, I'm still a biologist at heart. I think evolutionary biology um, uh, was a great place for me to sort of start my scientific journey because it, it is very broad and integrative. Uh, I'd say the computational biology as, as a, field or fields, right? You know, what is computational biology? It, it is quite quite broad. It's similarly integrative. Um, um, uh, uh, maybe, but maybe even, maybe it also presents a challenge in that the, the umbrella of computational biology is, is so large that sometimes um, students working in different subfields, like the, the, the questions or the approaches are different enough that you know, maybe there's, there's Maybe not quite the same level of of, of shared experience sometimes um, that I that I think maybe uh, or I I saw as a, you know in evolutionary biology, um, but I think I think many you know integrated fields like you know like evolutionary biology um, and certainly computational biology I, th I think they they provide that breadth I think that's that's critical I think that's I hope that's what we you know, I think that's what we should be striving for. Um, those of us who are involved in graduate graduate training and 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 helping to run graduate programs, and I and I, I think I, I hope that that's you know I hear that um, from graduate students. I think that they want you know maybe you tell me um, you know but students want want that breadth and that um, uh, that exposure to uh, many different approaches and ideas. Is that what you guys want? Those of you who are students? Yeah. I think so. It can be intimidating too, right? 
I mean, when I look at I look at I look at uh, uh, you know the 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 you know when you sort of sit on an admissions committee and you sort of conceptualize what the ideal student applying to a computational biology graduate program is, it's kind of intimidating actually, um, in the sense that um, because it's a very broad field, right? It really requires you to draw on on mathematics and, and computer science and biology. Um, and I often wonder how, you know, how realistic we are and um, and obviously some of that you can, you learn along the way, um, but that's, that's, those are non, a non-trivial um, you know, set of skills that we're, we're sort of expecting people to show up with on on day one, um, and I, uh, I, I, if it, if I had, you know, if I had all the money in the world to to fund graduate, uh, uh, graduate educations, uh, I'd almost, you know, I'd I'd say, you know, the the first two years we sh we should be setting aside for people to 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 think broadly and read broadly, um, and you know, do some rotations and take some classes, um, but I I. You know, if I had my way, I'd, I'd say, well, you shouldn't be thinking about prelims uh, in year two. You know, you should you should really be digging in um, and finding, uh, you know, learning about the history of the fields you work in, and and finding your niche and thinking about problems. Um, and then sometime in three, year three, you can go through that, you know, the, you know go through that hoop of of preliming. Um, you know, unfortunately, that's not not how how funding works. Um, you know, we don't have yeah, graduates, you know, time to completion is, is, uh, you know, something, you know, NIH and funding agencies keep track of. Um, and, um, and certainly um, uh, universities and graduate schools worry about, um, but I think in, in terms of intellectual development, that freedom to think is, is so key. Uh, so a couple questions here. Do you think the concept of pseudo time would become so popular when you first developed it? Uh, I'm quitting to reapplying to my <laughs> custom PhD program. All right. Yeah. So once I, once I get the uh, Gates Foundation funding for my my custom PhD program, uh, I'm happy to take applicants. Um, I don't know if 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 we thought the pseudo time uh, approach would become so popular. I think I think we thought it was a really cool idea. And, and our collaborator Paul Lazardi, I think, had some really um, it was really insightful in terms of um, both sort of proposing the idea and um, and the and um, and certainly he wanted to apply it to thinking about cancer progression. So I think we saw the immediate utility of it, um, um, but I certainly didn't see single cell sequencing. Now, well, that wasn't on the horizon. Um, you know, and that's where it's sort of taken off. Um, but it was a it was a really fun problem, right? Thinking about how to how to how to reconstruct time from a bunch of observations in a high in high dimensional spaces. Um, and and uh, um, Jun Young just sent me this uh, or clued me into into a Twitter thread uh, he had posted recently about about that. Um, and uh, Actually, quite insightful. There are a lot of details there that I had forgotten about how how that project developed. So, so I actually encourage you to, and maybe I'll post a link here if I can find it. Um, encourage you to, to to check out his Twitter thread in terms of I think it does a nice job of of outlining how we how, how that project developed. Um, but yeah, I didn't I didn't know it become and it wasn't it actually wasn't popular. That that I think that that paper languished in the in the handful of citations for I don't know. Uh, Seven or eight years before, um, uh, uh, before um, it sort of took off. Can you please comment on how to start up your laboratory successfully? Most of the required soft skills are not. Yes, this is. I should have included a discussion of this, right? Um, right. The soft skills of managing a laboratory. How do you how do you hire people? How do you build teams? How do you, um, uh, you know, how do you how do you be, become essentially a small business owner. You know, there's a lot of a lot of that in running a laboratory. Um, whew, that's a big one. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think I think actually we need, and I think you know some graduate programs are starting to do this. But I think I think we need. I think you should be as students demand, and as certainly if you're going to put your postdoc, you're sort of demanding demanding that or or asking for that. Um, and as 
faculty members and you know directors of graduate studies we should be we should be not only talking about it but but actually you know because most of us are have just learned by doing right we've been stumbling around in the dark ourselves um, but 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 there are people who have um, you know lots of deep insight into into these questions you know these the challenges of running laboratories and um, and what it you know how to manage people and I think we yeah, I, I guess my answer is yes. We need to do more of that, and I don't know if I, if, if my, you know, my my model has been to, you know, is the 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 sort of the blind man, um, trying to find my way, um, um, you know, lucky in some cases, unlucky in others, um, but yeah, I felt I felt completely unprepared, not completely unprepared, largely unprepared, to to, um, uh, to set up a laboratory, not in the what are we going to work on sense, but in how do you uh, how do you build a, a community of, of scientists working together and how do you manage um, the very real and important practical aspects of um, budgets and hiring and um, and projecting, you know, where things are, where, where budgets are going to be, you know, a year or two down the line. It's a real challenge. Uh, yeah. So we might want to wrap up, I guess, maybe in one la last 30 second tidbit. Um, how would you describe um, the role that computational biologists might have in an era where um, we can do most of our work at home, um, but you have things like NSF restrictions on um, what other people can do in, to, to contribute to science? Um, that could possibly, or I'm not actually sure how they remedied that, um, but but when not everyone has access to computational skills um, in their undergraduate uh, training, um, how do we continue to encourage and continue to diversify or um, make sure everyone's included in, in our field um, from the ground up moving forward in a pandemic, of course? Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a great question. Actually, one I've been thinking about a little bit because I started, started teaching a freshman freshman course in, in bioinformatics and, and and I've done a fair amount of like high school outreach and things like that. Um, I guess I guess being at, at home, if you have the time and the inclination and, the, and desire, and I, I really encourage it because for me, it's been a great opportunity, um, is I know a lot of um, our, a lot of uh, High schools and middle schools um, are looking for um, uh, excited young scientists to help uh, to to to, incur to get students involved in STEM um, STEM research. Um, uh, there's different models. The model I've been types of models I've been involved in are, are offering what are, what are called sort of mini terms, um, where um, um, we essentially put together you know a, a two or three day sort of workshop of um, sort of that gives us sort of a, a, a taste of computational biology and systems biology. And, um, and it, I think I, I, I've done those, you know, in person um, in prior years. I think it's actually interesting. I'd, I'd be very interested if, if people have models or are working on models of how to, um, how to do that um, remotely. Um, you know, we've done it with Python notebooks, so I can sort of see ways you know that at least the materials and the types of things that students can do online, um, how we can adapt that. Um, I still, um, you know, it, the 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 challenge of of how to um, uh, actually teach remotely, um, especially especially to like middle school students and high school students, um, that's still to me it, it, it's not a insurmountable, but it's a it's, it is a real I think a real challenge. I mean, I think students are getting used to it, right? I think maybe maybe now, where we are in the in the pandemic, uh, that's a little bit more the norm. Um, um, but what I, in my past experience, I think one of the critical things was actually being in the room with people and 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 talking about and 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 the excitement of science. Um, and I guess the challenge for me is how do I how do I try and do that? You know, how can we think about doing that online um, uh, to to diverse students? Um, uh, you know, given the current circumstances. 
Yeah, um, and I think certainly as an organization, that's something we're trying to, well, at least a goal that I would have for us, um, since so many of us are, are so talented and have the skills and everything we have been doing at this point has been virtual. Um, so I definitely think we have the brain power and, and have appreciate, you, uh, you know, leaders like you and, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna ask, have you, uh, has, has, uh, Black women in computational biology actually partnered with particular schools or, or tried to do um, this sort Not of outreach? Yet. Not yet. So, if, you know, so, if, if anybody on this call is interested, I'd be happy to also help um, get involved in such an yeah. effort. Um, you know, yeah, that's something that's, um, that would definitely be helpful. And um, probably my, my first idea was something like Black Girls Code. Um, but I think on a more local level, doing it with, with schools. Uh, could be impactful. It's also hard because uh, so many of our members are not in, on this side of the pond. So <laughs> we, I would also like for members to feel like they can do something um, where they are and, and feel like um, they can have an impact mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in those schools as well. But but yeah, I, I like the school idea, like more, more grassroots type. And I will mention, you know, I, for my course this semester, I was doing we we're using a lot of COVID examples, right? All there's this huge amount of COVID data available, and that's highly motivating for you know at least the freshmen in my in my class, and I assume um, you know high school and, and middle school students would also immediately see um, and be motivated by you know what can we do to understand COVID. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, well, we'll be in touch. Sorry, everyone, it, it went so much over, but I, I really think everyone was engaged, and I appreciate um, everyone for for staying this long and, and for tuning in. And Paul, again, thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. Um, uh, yeah, so, so that wraps it up for, for this series this semester. Um, everyone should have gotten an email that we have some stuff planned for January um, starting up next semester. So if you want to learn more about us, uh, just stay tuned online and, uh, and, and we'll be in touch. But thank you, everyone, for being here and, and enjoy your days. Bye. Thanks, Janae. Sorry for everybody for running a little bit late. <laughs> it's OK.